Welcome to the future of video <laughs> games. Ooh. So um, to give you an idea behind this, um, it's, I'd essentially say that this talk is a Twitter discussion that got out of hand. Um, but the idea behind it was instead of doing the usual thing that I tend to do when I come to one of these events, so I, I'm a sort of a games journalist by trade in terms of my background, I thought let's instead play a bit of a game and try and guess what kind of jobs people like yourselves might be doing in the future. Because if you know what jobs you're going to be doing maybe four or five years down the line, you never know. It could give you a vital competitive advantage in life in general. So, new phone who dis? Uh, I'm George Osborne. I'm a writer and analyst working in video games industry. I'm not the editor of the Evening Standard and I'm not the former Chancellor of the Exchequer. I've written for publications like Eurogamer, Rock Paper Shotgun, The Guardian. I've also worked with companies like Yuki, um, Nuzu, and Indigo Pearl, who are a leading PR company, to produce research and reports on a range of topics, which is the reason why I feel semi-equipped to attempt to pronounce upon the future of the games industry. I mean, it's a risky thing to do, but I like to live life on the edge, so that's for sure. So why am I talking about this? So here is my attempt to justify why someone is paying for me to come down to this event. I think thinking ahead actually in the games industry will help you get ahead. You know, knowing where the industry is at this moment in time is going to help you start thinking about where your opportunities for jobs are going to develop in the future. I think understanding a bit about how business models are changing is going to help you make good decisions on the fly. So you might see an interesting opportunity opening up in a market and go, cool, blimey, I'll best get on top of that. And then just on top of it, getting to grips with the way that the industry culture is changing. Oh, there we go. Um, it provides a chance for essentially you're going to keep running back in front of the slides. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, getting to grips with the fact that the industry culture is changing as well, I think was going to help you understand and give you a better opportunity to essentially present yourself in the industry for the long term. So in terms of thinking about where we are in the video games industry today and what's going on. So the good news for everyone in this room and the good news practically for myself as well as I'm working in the industry today is that the industry has been growing quickly for a number of years now. So in 2016, uh, it was a bit of a landmark year for the video games industry because digital video games revenues exceeded $100 billion worldwide. Um, to put it in context, most people are essentially suggesting that the video games industry is now roughly equivalent of film and TV put together in terms of those revenues. So that is enormous. Um, in the UK, the number of employees in the games industry is growing. So the BFI um, recently produced a report about the screen sectors, which came out in October 2018. If you look at all of the jobs, either within the games industry, working as a developer, as a publisher, working in an adjacent sector like PR and marketing, or working within sectors that are essentially closely linked to it, they found out that about 47,000 people were working full-time in the British video games industry. Last time they did that report, so that data was for 2016. Last time they did it was back in 2015 for data in 2013. They were reckoning it was about 23,000. So the industry in the UK in terms of number of employees has doubled in size in about three years, which is pretty impressive. And then just in general, the number of games on the up. On mobile game stores, it's been the case that there have been hundreds of thousands of games released over the last few years. In PC, last year, there were as many games released on Steam as there were in the decade between 2006 and 2016. Now that means, obviously, that there is a lot of competition within the market. But it also means there are a lot of people working on video games and they're going to need talented people to work with. So to give you an idea about what that industry looks like and what it's looking like in the future, so Newzu have been tracking this data for a long time. I think they're generally considered to be one of the best for forecasting the size of the market. You can see that in 2012, it's about 70 billion. And then by 2021, it's going to be 180.1 billion. Now, of course, forecasts are always tricky to do, always tricky to know where precisely the industry is going to go. However, Newzu have historically low-balled their forecasts. So they have always gone lower than they've actually ended up coming out as. So it's a realistic guess to say that probably by the time we're hitting 2021, 2022, the industry could have trebled in size in the course of a decade. So in terms of more money coming to the system, that's obviously more jobs for you guys, which is great. Um, the other element to it as well, though, is that when you're thinking about, well, what's been driving that growth? And what does that mean for the future of the sector? Well, I think the biggest things have been new platforms, new ways of doing business, and just some the interesting way that particular trends have helped reshape the industry, show you where some of the opportunities are going to be coming up. So mobile gaming, um, I've put that back as sort of 2008 at the moment where it really became big. Um, obviously, that's not entirely the case. Uh, Snake was on Nokia 3310s back in the late 1990s. That got to 300 phones around the world, but there wasn't any way of meaningfully making money from it. So they had a whole system of essentially 
the people would develop the games, they would go straight onto the devices, and the person who created it would get a fraction of something. Then the App Store arrived. Then smartphones arrived a decade later in about 2008, 2009. And what that did is it created this enormous market opportunity because it both allowed developers to distribute around the world. It allows a huge number of people to come into the games market who hadn't previously done so before, so anyone who owns a smartphone. And then as smartphone penetration has increased around the world, for example, in Southeast Asia, it's now above 50% in most territories. That has opened up this huge, massive increase of players, which has opened up a market sector that is now bigger than PC and console. So that is an example about how a trend can completely reshape the industry. In terms of business models, games as a service. Now, I think this is the really big one that everyone needs to pay attention to over sort of the next decade and off into the future of the industry, is that games have stopped being about simply selling a one-off product where you make 50 or 60 pounds off a single boxed unit and that's that. Games are now much more about how much money do you generate over the lifetime of that particular player. So what happened was games as a service existed prior to 2011 in things like World of Warcraft and RuneScape. But when 2012, 2013 came around and mobile gaming massively expanded the player base, games like Candy Crush Saga and Clash of Clans essentially were able to find out that by creating engaging long-term gaming services that distribute content to players, all of the time and continue to give them new updates. They were able to get players spending consistently and constantly. Even this year, uh, Candy Crush Saga, for example, it's been out since 2012. It's forecast to make another billion dollars this year. So it's been generating a billion every single year practically since it's come out. So as a result of that, a lot of other companies have started adopting service models. So your favorite games on PC and console, everything from Rocket League, Overwatch, Rainbow Six, you may pay up front to get the game, but the way they're monetizing players over the long term is through season passes, through things like the battle pass, which I'll come to in a second, and other things. So what that means, player value is much more important in the long term, so it's important to keep creating content for those games. And then finally, things like Battle Royale, I think is a good example of the way these two things, I think, were longer term trends, mobile gaming and games as a service were on the way up. I think the Battle Royale is a very good example about the way that the industry can seemingly change overnight, because prior to 2017, the genre existed as essentially a mod. Um, you know, you could go and play various modded games and that would be about it. And then when PUBG arrives on the scene, it suddenly starts dominating everything. It's not only the game that at the time was having the most concurrent players on Steam. I think at one point it had 1.5 million people playing concurrently on Steam last year. It also was breaking things like Twitch stream records. And then what happens was, well, Fortnite came in later in the year, a game that was not at all a battle royale, that adapted itself to create a battle royale mode in the middle of last year released that in September, and then by this point this year, it's the biggest video game in the world and arguably the mm. biggest cultural phenomenon in the world. So the point is, and what is the discussion, why am I talking about all of these things, is that you'll see that longer term trends all can feed into one another. Mm. So if you look, for example, from mobile gaming to games and services Battle Royale, think about the fact that Fortnite's recently released on mobile. Think about mm. its business model, about the fact that it's actually going for that full service thing, and you can start seeing where those market opportunities are coming. And then just as one other thing that's going to be changing the job market, I think it's important to think about the way that changing working practices are going to shift what's becoming available. So I think it's easy to think about things like Unreal Engine and things like Unity, I'm going to keep that one quiet in here, um, as tools that we are all very familiar with and very familiar with using. But actually the fact that they democratized game development and made it possible for so many people around the world, I think that's changed the nature of the industry. It's opened up this huge market of video games because more people can make them. But at the same time as these new technologies are changing the number of studios that are available, consumer expectations are changing as well at the same time. So with games as a service, service is the key element to it. When you're talking about a product-based game, you may be more tempted to just release it and provide a little bit of support and that's it. Whereas if you're talking about games as a service, you're talking much more about people expecting <coughs> custom service, you're expecting players to want new content, and you're also expecting players to become better educated about how various mechanics work within the game. So if, for example, you start producing a game and you were to start cynically using using loot boxes in a cynical manner, consumers are much better at picking up on it, complaining about it, and motivating themselves around it. So you need to learn to manage that. 
And then just in general, um, anyone who's kept their eye on the news recently will see that the industry's business culture is changing as well. So um, best practices like canning crunch, you know, this is one of the big, huge conversations at the moment. If you go on Kotaku today, there's an incredibly good article about Red Dead Redemption 2 and Rockstar's crunch culture, um, which shows you first of all about the way those big studios work and shows you the way that the industry is starting to respond against them. Um, and as that's happening, that is going to open up new opportunities too. And um, that was Games Industry Biz who were talking about this recently as well. And so all of those things, when you think about the way that the industry is developing, the way the fact that the whole pie is growing overall, the way that new market opportunities are developing as a result of changes within market trends, and the way that business cultures are changing, it leads, I think, to four things changing within the job market overall. So first of all, services, not just products. Players are in it for the long haul, you are in it for the long haul. You know, there was a really good talk about um, Supercell's way of developing games. They're the makers of Clash of Clans. The CEO, Ilka Parnanen, said that their teams, when they're deciding which games they're going to proceed with, they have to decide which game they want to make for the next five years. Because, not because the game will take them five years to make, but because they will take two or three months to iterate the prototype, get it then to a point of releasing on the store, and then maintain the service for a minimum of four years. So, as a creator or as someone working on those games, that is going to change the way you work. Next thing as well, huge player bases, right? So if you're talking about, say, the expansion of mobile gaming, mm -hmm. King talk about their number of players in how many tens of millions of monthly active users they've got, how many hundreds of millions in some mm -hmm. cases. So once you've got that many players playing, how do you keep them all happy? How do you keep them going within the game? How do you stop other people from getting hold of those players? That's an important thing to consider. I also think that there's a wider range of skill levels in companies that I think need to fit together. I think video games, the way I've described it to people who aren't in the industry, it's a bit like you've got to build a bridge that works in a technical sense. The bridge also has to be aesthetically pleasing because or otherwise people aren't going to look at it. And it also has to be fun to run across that bridge. You've got to come across it screaming in delight which means you're going to need people who are able to bring together those different elements of the business. If you can't find ways to start bridging the aesthetic side, the mechanical side, and the actual sort of technical production side, your company is going to suffer in comparison to others. And then just in general, the other thing to always keep an eye on is developing market opportunities. You know, I'm going to bring up in one of the roles of the future a market opportunity that's really only been emerging in probably the past year or two. But I think if you can start keeping aware of the fact that with those three bigger changes, there is always the possibility that some other change will come in and transform the way you're working. It's going to start helping you to future-proof what you're doing. So, jobs of the future. Um, some crowdsourced suggestions. So, what happened was, instead of me doing any work, I just went onto Twitter um, and asked people to provide me with suggestions. You can also see I used a GIF. Um, there we go. Exactly. Well, exactly. Someone enjoyed it. That's the main thing. Um, but having put that out there and then putting out a couple of variations of it, there are five roles that I think particularly jumped out at me um, and that I want to talk to you about. So the first one is the technical insert role. So um, it could be, say, for example, let's go in the immediate instance about the technical artist. Um, so the suggestion came from Jodie Ajar. She worked at, um, very recently at Creative Assembly and she's just set up a new company. Um, the idea behind the technical role is that it obviously sits as some sort of hybrid between the traditional creative discipline that it represents, so for example the artist, and the more programming side, so working as a developer as well alongside it. And the point about those technical roles is they're not just about specifically, say, creating the art or creating the game. They're about bridging the gap between the two of them. So they're about selecting which tools people are going to use, building and maintaining the systems that will, say, govern things like asset uploads, policing what types of assets are going in and policing things like, you know, what type of file size or whatever. And then on top of it, just generally acting as a gatekeeper for that process. So, you know, I went and spoke to people and said, so why is this role growing? Because I was doing a bit of research and saying, well, the first time I saw it popping up was about a decade ago. So why is it seen as such an important job of the future mm. now? Um, and I think it comes back to this point that I was mentioning about democratizing access to tools, mm. is that you have a lot more people who are very capable of using a number of different tools, but those people may not necessarily then in themselves have the expertise to go beyond those tools, or they may be using tools that rely upon someone else to create something for them to put into it. And in that particular set of circumstances, so you know, someone who's, for example, working with an audio tool, 
is it better for you to have one person who manages the tool and is trying to do something involved in actually creating the audio themselves or is it better to have two separate experts one who works on the audio one who works with the tool and have someone who works as a bridge companies are increasingly arguing that it's better to have that person acting as a bridge because it makes things more efficient because those people will instead be able to sit down there look at the process for uploads look at the way that things are going on and because they have that blend of skill between the traditional creative role that they're interested in and the technical side of things, they're able to spot things like when, for example, art assets are causing the game to start slowing down for any particular reason. They are able to go in and start fixing that on behalf of people. So that allows people who are more on the technical side of things and who don't have those creative skills to focus on their technical skills. Whereas on the other side, on the more creative angle, those people can then go and focus on that work. And I think in terms of is this a job for the future? Actually, it's kind of a job for today. You know, I went online and just started searching for different permutations of what technical is. I apologize for the graininess of the imagery. But Rare, Ubisoft, Creative Assembly, each of them had different technical roles within different fields. So here you can see animation, audio, and someone who's working within the artist field. So it's quite clear that the leading games companies are seeing that bridging role as an important one for the future of their studios. Will you be able to jump into one of those roles immediately? It might be quite challenging um, because a lot of these are going towards more senior level employees. But if you're thinking about a role for your future and thinking about a place that you might be wanting to develop to further down the line, I think this is something that people should definitely be considering. Next one is obviously not quite as development focused, uh, is the community manager. Mm. And I'm sure that plenty of you are aware of the community management role anyway at the moment. Um, they're essentially supporting player base within games um, and also outside of them on things like social media. Um, they can be dedicated to one particular game if the company is big enough or they can be working across a whole studio, working on multiple different games. In a sense, they're acting as like the first line of customer support for many brands and games because they're often the people who people associate the game or the company with, or they're the people that they're essentially talking to online. But they also go beyond that. You know, they are people who are responsible for creating content. In many instances, they'll be doing things like running events. And in general, they'll be fostering connections as well with creators. It will be not just leaving the whole thing about, oh, there's a creator, we'll leave that to PR. In many cases, the community manager will actually go, I see what you're doing, I'll bring you into the job. So why is community management important? So it comes down to a really basic principle of marketing. And this is something I used to work in the mobile game sector. And I had the misfortune of working in mobile advertising companies. And they essentially said to me that it is cheaper to retain or re-engage an existing spending customer than acquiring a new one. So what that means is that your cost of acquisition for a new person who's never played your game before is going to be much higher than if you can find someone who's previously played your game and keep their interest. So what does that mean? Well, for advertising, it meant things like, let's focus on adverts that specifically re-engage a certain type of user. But for people working with marketing and community, uh, marketing and PR disciplines, community is one of the best ways of solving that problem. Because if you have someone who is constantly present, who's specifically related to a lot of these service-based games, if they are there to help players, if they are there to encourage creators and fans to engage with what is going on, and they are able to help solve problems when they begin to pop up in the first place, or at least help point people towards solutions, they are ultimately going to reduce the number of players who churn out from a game. And in a competitive market, where, like I say, there might be hundreds, maybe thousands of games releasing every single month if you're looking across all platforms, these people will often be in that position to actually keep your players interested and keep them engaged. And again, I was going to say, is this a job for the future? It's a job for today. Like This is, again, another one of those roles that is becoming more important as companies recognise the value of it. But if you go and search online, you know, you can see... Rockstar game, Ubisoft, Sega. Like that, that took me all of two minutes to find those four jobs within the video games industry. And I think what will happen is, and my gut feeling is that there might even be more appetite in the future for freelance community managers who actually start servicing smaller companies, particularly indie game companies, um, because a lot of these bigger companies can obviously afford the cost of having a full-time employee dedicated to it but in general I think especially if you're looking towards marketing disciplines and what's going to be useful if you are savvy on social media you are capable of talking to people effectively and you're a creator a community role I think is a really good way to go.
So I'm now starting to get, I will admit, I do not have a technical background, so this is a risky set of slides for me. Um, AI machine learning and procedural generation. Um, I would like to highlight that in this particular slide, I gave much more prominence to the tweeter. This is because Tommy Thompson is a leading AI in games lecturer. Um, he, is, he has also got a YouTube channel called AI in Games, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but he was essentially going, I said, Tommy, could you recommend me a job? And he just gave me a list of stuff. So the question is, why am I bringing this up as a job of the future? Because, again, if you think about AI and a lot of those roles like procedural generation, we've, can't, we've already seen games do this. You know, we're all aware of Spelunky and its procedural generation work and the way that Derek Yu managed to do very clever things with a combination of that procedural generation plus his own offering. Um, Boss's Worlds Adrift, I know, is using a bit of machine learning to go and help govern the systems that are working in there. And when we're thinking about AI in games, you know, the AI in Alien Isolation is obviously one of the key examples of one that works really effectively in the way that you can see it almost adapting to your behavior. So if they're already prominent, why is it worth you thinking specifically about this as a job for the future? Um, so yeah, you know, convincing AI always has been an important part of a convincing game experience. So that is always going to mean that there are roles available in these kinds of fields. But in a world where content needs to be made quickly at scale, and we need to be basically making sure that everything is feeling convincing while we're doing that, things like machine learning, procedural generation will actually help us to do that. So procedural generation will obviously help with the content issue because if you can get that right and strike that right balance between systems doing things and offering it, you can create amazing levels and whatever. Um, but with machine learning as well, it will also help AIs adapt so that if players start messing around with the meta in a particular game, they are less likely, the game is less likely to break itself. But more than that, and I think this is something for everyone in this room to think about, we're in the middle of what some people are calling the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and this is essentially the sort of the next stage of the digital revolution, which is expanded upon with mobile computing power, new technologies like art artificial intelligence, essentially leading to sort of a reordering of society. And at the moment, the government is putting a lot of money into artificial intelligence in terms of its own particular investment areas. Companies are investing a lot into AI and the potential functionalities that it can bring to things like medicine and care in the home. And what that means is that video games are very nicely placed to essentially act as the playground for new technologies. Go into the video game environment, learn to build these AI systems, build them so, to the point where they are working convincingly, and then start considering about where they can be applied elsewhere. By getting into this field early, you are getting into probably one of the most important growth fields across the entire economy. That means that even if you reach a point where video games aren't your jam anymore, or you reach the point where you don't want to work on video games projects as much, you will be very well placed to move into the wider economy and contribute. Next one, and this was about growing market opportunities, esports team managers. So Laura Martin, she actually works at UKE on the Digital Schoolhouse project, which is principally about expanding the use of computing within schools by helping upskill teachers and encouraging more creative ways of engaging with computing. But they've also recently started running an esports tournament as a way of reaching out to people in a different way. There we go, nicely teed up. Um, so I spoke to Laura and she did not say, you're giving a talk about jobs of the future in the video games industry. You should talk about jobs in esports, like becoming an esports manager. She didn't actually say that. She said something very similar to that though, so I put that quote up. But the point was that actually an esports team manager is quite an interesting potential new job opportunity of the future. So I'm actually just gonna quickly explain like what a team manager is meant to do. So essentially an esports team manager I think works in quite a similar way to like a chief executive of a leading sports team. So they're responsible for running the team, they're gonna be hiring staff, creating teams to compete within specific esports across different various competitions. And I think because esports is in this developing space at the moment, they can also be responsible for the brand's marketing commercial side of the business. So Derek Tuang here, he's the general manager of NRG Esports. Uh, NRG is one of the leading esports teams in North America. It's also my favorite Rocket League team. So that's the reason why I put him on the slide. Um, but the point about why do you want to consider this as a job role for the future, because it hasn't uh, it hasn't crossed my mind until very recently that it could be. But there's a few things that really stand out. So the first one is that it is a growth opportunity. So you know what I was saying earlier about spot the opportunities within the market and potentially try and take advantage of it. Esports by 2020 is going to be a billion dollar market, having been worth a couple of hundred million this time last year. 
So it's on a growth trajectory. Importantly, it's growing a lot and very quickly within North America and across Asia. So if you're particularly interested in working in either of those territories, there's a great opportunity there. Um, but more pertinently than that, there's serious interest from leading brands into this market because one of the things that's really interesting, if you look at a breakdown of where esports revenues currently come for, from at the moment, if you compare it side by side with Deloitte's investigation into the finances of the top 20 football clubs mm. in the world, you realise that mm. the top 20 football clubs in the world make a similar amount of money through commercial deals, ticketing and broadcast revenues. It's almost an exact ratio to the way that esports companies are making their mm. money. Mm. So leading brands are aware of the fact that this market, if you think that that business model is probably quite applicable elsewhere, they are looking at it and going, if we put a little bit of money in it now and this market grows, we are going to get a serious return on our investment here and find a new way of reaching younger consumers who we might be struggling to reach right now. So there's that. And then lastly, and kind of tied into that thing, any sector which is growing but is fragmented in the way that the esports sector is, where there are different esports with different league structures and everything like that, it is difficult to make money in it but anyone who is capable of producing something that either works across that fragmentation or unifies that fragmentation will tend to make themselves a very rich person. Um, that is almost, in a sense, kind of what happened with the mobile gaming space and the way that Apple ended up dominating it. So if you look at this as an opportunity, might be able to deliver something in returns. I'm not going to guarantee you're going to get anything from it, but worth considering. And then finally, this one is off to a flight of, flight of fancy. So an emergent behavior analyst. Has anyone ever heard of an emergent behavior analyst? Oh, there we go. There's a hand down there. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, we've got one person who has, but that makes me feel better because I gambled upon this being my, this really could be a job of the future. So I'm actually going to read this off the slide to make sure I get this properly. So emergent behavior, it's a property that emerges due to interactions among the components of a system. So an EB analyst would examine how individuals operate within the structure of a game system. So we're not talking here about emergent gameplay, we're talking about emergent behaviours within the systems of games. So what could drive the emergence of something like this? Actually, I'm going to just quickly skip through and then skip back because I think this is a better way around of doing it. So why could the role be important? So if we jump back to our point earlier, talking about the prominence of games like Fortnite, the rise of service-based multiplayer games, games are increasingly featuring tens, hundreds, thousands of players in lobbies at the same time, multiple different lobbies, potentially millions of players in the game at once. That means that lot of, lots of individual data points is being generated and you can learn a lot about it. There's a very interesting article from Keith Stewart about Destiny um, and about the way that Bungie inserted into the first Destiny a load of game analytics stuff so that they can measure how often certain weapons were being used to start tracking, you know, for example, if a certain gun was overpowered and people were using it too much and whatever. But the whole point about that is that a lot of that is like individual data that's just starting to be aggregated. The point about emergent behavior and the thing that I have read on the internet since someone made me aware of this as, as an entire prospect, is it works on the principle that you can't understand a stock market crash from the actions of the individuals alone. So the whole thing about, what, sorry? System problem. A system problem, exactly, like that's it. So instead of the emergent behavior of the person looking just solely at the individual actions and trying to work something out, they are instead looking to create the intellectual framework for dealing with the structural and systemic challenges caused by individual behavior within the context of a video game. So this could help developers understand much more effectively how changes in the meta effect play at a systemic level. It could provide advice for games designers iterated on their service titles to think about this is a potential direction to go off in. Um, it's also going to help predict changes for how players may react to, say for example, a change in the game in the future. So instead of simply just going, we might change this because we think this is popular. Instead, it's someone who's looking at the way that previous changes to the system have affected the way it behaves and going, we can forecast that this will have this impact on players. Now, will this job exist? I don't actually know. Um, I tried to find some online for video games companies after someone suggested to me on Twitter. Didn't find a single one. Couldn't find one anyway. But to go back to that previous slide, you know, there are a few things that are driving its emergence forward. So online multiplayer, popularity obviously keeps growing, got GTA Online there, but chances are, I think it's a reasonable bet to make that one of the most popular games that each of you are playing in this room will be an online multiplayer game that you play with your friends. So uh, it's, it's on the rise. Again, there are new technologies that are democratizing the multiplayer game development space. So Spatial OS um, by the team at Improbable. 
it has allowed people to do various different things from, I think they recently released a demo for a 100 player FPS that you can develop in 48 hours um, using Spatial. That happened, I think, in the last two weeks. Um, it was an independent studio who's working on an MMO. There's four of them in the studio and they're using this technology to build an MMO. And as a result of that, I think what you're gonna start seeing is that teams that are dealing with bigger audiences, much, much bigger audiences, are going to need more help actually understanding everything that's going on. So potentially, the emergent behavior analyst could emerge, or they could not. It's a complete guess. So that's fun. And just one more thing, because I'm hitting the end of my talk and I'm being, I'm being threatened by Kirsty over there. Um, although these new jobs could emerge, might emerge, might change, whatever, pretty much all the other jobs that previously existed ever are going to just hang around as well. That's the, the important thing to remember, is that you, know, you will hear lots about community management, esports, all of these new fields. But it's not a case of the pie is set at one particular size. And if you're getting jobs in one place, it means you're losing out in other places. It is built upon previous work. So if you are looking to work as a traditional programmer, those jobs are still going to be around. If you're looking to work within a marketing discipline, those jobs are still going to exist. The extent to which they exist in the form we see them today, that's always open to question. Job roles always evolve over time, but they will likely remain part of it. So don't worry too much if the jobs of the future stuff sounded terrifying. You're all going to find a job. It's going to be easy, I promise. There we go. And if you've got any questions, you can get in touch there. Don't use LinkedIn, especially for contacting me. Um, I mean, do use LinkedIn, but just not for talking to me. It's not the best way to reach me. So thank you very much. <laughs>